The budget for each episode in the first season was 130000 a modest amount for such a series. The Jupiter 2 set cost 350000 which made it the most expensive TV set at that time. In the first pilot, the Robinsons were said to be in a state of suspended animation for 98 years. In the second pilot, first episode, they were said to be in a state of suspended animation for only 5 years. The One-Eyed Giant is first seen in the original unaired pilot, but in the series, the giant isn't seen until episode 4. In the second pilot, the departure date of the Robinsons is October the 16th of 1997. Their mission is to travel in the Jupiter 2 to a planet circling the star Alpha Centauri to colonize deep space after the sabotage of the ship by Dr. Smith, who becomes a stowaway on board which sets the Jupiter 2 off course. The ship crash lands on an unknown alien world, later identified by Will as Proplanus, where they spend the whole season. The first year was in black and white. Erwin Allen and his writers took the premise quite seriously at this point, making a very straightforward family in peril sci-fi adventure show. The first season was by far the best season, as far as writing went, with highly imaginative, great character-driven storylines. The season 2 and 3 episodes was where I felt the show lost its way, as far as quality of storytelling. I found season 1 to be very enjoyable, and found it to be great quality entertainment, with great characters and storylines. The episodes that truly stand out to me was The Derelict, There Were Giants on the Earth, Invaders of the Fifth Dimension, Return from Outer Space, My Friend Mr. Nobody, The Keeper Part 1 and 2 starring Michael Rennie, the only two-parter in the entire series run, and Follow the Leader, a fantastic episode that truly showcases Guy Williams' talent, a talent that seemed to be wasted throughout Season 2 and 3. Follow the Leader would act as the finale of Season 1, one of the major elements in Lost in Space was the amazing music by the great John Williams, who would compose two of the opening and closing themes of the show. The first version used in seasons 1 and 2, and the second one in season 3. The original pilot and much of season 1 reused Bernard Herrmann's eerie score from the classic sci-fi film The Day the Earth Stood Still. While John Williams would compose the music for season 1 episodes, My Friend Mr. Nobody, one of Williams' best scores, including The Reluctant Stowaway, Island in the Sky, and The Hungry Sea. These scores helped Williams gain more notoriety as a composer. Season 3's opening music by John Williams is exciting and truly one of the most epic music openings of any TV show. CBS chairman William Paley was someone who prided himself on the fact that CBS produced quality, thoughtful programming apparently hated the show. He instructed his executives to cancel it the minute its ratings dipped. But luckily, because of season 1's success, the show would be picked up for two more seasons. For season 2, Lost in Space would have new competition from the series Batman, which was a ratings hit, offering up campy humour and in-jokes. In order to compete with Batman, Erwin Allen turned Lost in Space from a straight-out, family-in-peril space adventure story into an over-the-top action, with over-the-top villains with crazy storylines. And the quality of the show dropped, and the episodes all focused on Will, Smith, and the robot, and the other cast members became merely background actors. But it wasn't all bad, there were some moments of greatness in Season 2 and 3. One perfect example of this was the episode The Antimatter Man, about a mirror universe where Professor Robinson, Major Don, are evil opposites of themselves. This episode was somewhat reminiscent of the Star Trek episode Mirror Mirror, released two months prior, and it was finally a chance for Guy Williams to shine after being merely a support actor. It also gave Mark Goddard more to do in the episode also. Uh, I liked the Antimatter Man, which really featured Guy more than it did me, but that was good. And I liked my character in it. It was a character that had a beard and a bad eye, and he was a bad guy, two sides. So Don West was good and bad in that one, and that was kind of fun to do. The Antimatter Man, yeah. The Antimatter Man certainly showed everyone 
that Lost in Space could be taken seriously for a change. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last, and they would go back to the campiness the show was now known for. This certainly confirmed this, with episodes like The Great Vegetable Rebellion. It all started when one of the show's best scriptwriters, Peter Packer, submitted his 23rd and last script for the series, which was originally titled Carnival in Space. This initial draft was not the most exciting of episodes, but nonetheless, Irwin Allen saw great potential in the script and bought the idea. It was written by Peter Packer, who I think was our best writer. He came into my dressing room one day, and he had something behind his back. I said, what you got there? He said, you won't like it. I said, let me make the decision. And he handed over the great vegetable he did. Well, I found that to be a very amusing title to begin with. Went home, read it, and then I understood it. It's a disaster. Poor Peter. He said, I've written myself out. I don't have another idea in my head. I said, well, I'm sorry. Do we have to do this one? He said, Irvin said, sure, why not? Incidentally, stars Guy Williams and June Lockhart were in fact written out of the next two episodes at full salary due to their uncontrollable laughter during filming of a scene. Mark Goddard would later recall that he found it so difficult he actually turned away from the camera to resist the impulse to laugh when Tybo the Carrot Alien was talking. Tybo the Giant Carrot was played by Stanley Adams who would appear in the classic Star Trek episode, The Trouble with Tribbles, playing a Tribble salesman. The Great Vegetable Rebellion was also going to be the episode that would introduce the audience to a new character, a purple llama named Willoughby. But the llama was written out of the storyline. Willoughby the llama was actually still listed in the closing credits. Owen Allen loved to reuse props, recycled from other Owen Allen shows to save on money. Some of the computers in Lost in Space were also used on other TV shows and movies, including Batman, which was seen in the Batcave, and computer props would even show up in Irwin Allen's films, like Towering Inferno. Spacecraft models in Lost in Space were also reused throughout the series. One of the many things I loved was the amazing spacecrafts on the show, especially the Jupiter II, a sleek looking spaceship in its design. The Chariot. The all-terrain vehicle was of course one of the many highlights in the series, which the Robinsons would make great use out of in many episodes. The space pod, which was first seen in Season 3 of Lost in Space, was in fact modelled after the Apollo Lunar Module. The jetpack was one thing I enjoyed on the show, which was used occasionally by Professor Robinson. One of the major highs of Lost in Space was its guest stars, and it certainly had a diverse array of actors, including Michael Answerer, John Carradine, Werner Klemperer, Al Lewis from The Monsters, Don Matheson, who would later star in Irwin Allen's Land of the Giants, Michael J. Pollard, and a very young Kurt Russell. I'm going to be in 50 of these different kind of things, you know, because yeah. I did all those shows yeah. when I was young. Well, I, was, I played, my character was Gu Guano. Guano? Guano, which we learned, <laughs> we learned during the making. Somebody finally said, Is, doesn't Guano mean bad? <laughs> it was, it was, so there I was. Well, how yes. old were you when you did this? About 14? 15? Uh, I was about 12, I think, or 13, 12 or 13. Okay. But one of the most famous stars to appear on Lost in Space was Michael Rennie. And I did like the uh, Michael Rennie uh, part, the, the keeper the from the, yeah. the first yeah. season. That's a favorite here. Yeah. He's a very classy actor, and my favorite science fiction film is The Day of the Earth Stood Still, mm -hmm. which starred Michael Rennie. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I enjoyed working with him. Michael Rennie did a two-parter. Oh, what a, re a reunion that was. We became very good friends. By the third and final season, the ratings for Lost in Space dropped quickly. During this time, Owen Allen was constantly working on new projects. In the last year of the show, he was working on two new ideas, Land of the Giants and Man from the 25th Century. But Irwin Allen would still show up on set to offer new ideas, give commands, or settle a dispute. Tone of the show pretty much shifted from an ensemble adventure pioneer family against the alien environment show to a Dr. Smith the Robot and Will Robinson show. Uh, and we had a wonderful chemistry together. You know, uh, obviously the chemistry between Jonathan and, and myself and Bobby made inside the robot too, to a degree. And I think it's probably safe to say it has a lot to do with the reason that we 
ended up with the bulk of the work is because we would go in there and do it in one take. We never screwed up. I mean, I, it's true, it, it is true. We just, we, did, we didn't mess up. We'd go in there, we knew our lines. You know, you learn certain things in, in show business. I loved what I had to do. I was very aware of the fact that my friends uh, were greatly diminished. During negotiations with Alan and the studio regarding the series direction for the fourth season, Alan was furious when the studio told him that the budget would be cut by 15% and due to season 3 ratings showing an increased percentage of children as the total viewers, this would mean a drop in the quality audience which advertisers would prefer. Sadly, it wasn't looking good for Lost in Space. The cast and crew actually believed that the series would return for a fourth season and Alan even ordered new scripts for the coming season. But the CBS network would announce two weeks later that the show would not be picked up for its new TV lineup and Lost in Space was cancelled without any reasons or explanations by the network. With the cancellation of Lost in Space, it was a relief for some actors on the show, especially Guy Williams, who grew tired of season 2 and 3's campy quality, which was more focused on Jonathan Harris in his role of Dr. Smith. Guy Williams, a lovely gentleman, very bright. Unfortunately, we could never be friends because Guy Williams was hired to be the father figure and the star of the show. And suddenly what happened? Jonathan Harris is the star of the show. And that's what happened. How could we be friends? I was upset about that because I know that he was suffering as a result. He became almost a walk-on. Billy Moomy loved working with Guy especially in the tender father and son scenes. After the cancellation of the show, an animated pilot version of Lost in Space was produced by Hanna-Barbera. However, plans for a series were cancelled. It had no point, the characters were awful, the writing was dreadful, and that was the end of that. I have been a fan of Lost in Space for all my life. Maybe it's nostalgia, and maybe you needed to grow up with it to truly appreciate it. Season 1 was an amazing season that had some well-written episodes that were fun and imaginative. I really think the series lost that in the second season. The stories got silly and very campy because Owen Allen wanted to compete with the campiness of Batman and after a while it didn't seem to be about characters anymore. The last example of great writing was with the episode The Antimatter Man, which made better use out of Guy Williams, who I thought was definitely wasted in his role. But all criticism aside, I will always look back on the show with fond memories every time I return to the series and watch it. My name's Jonathan. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and like what you see on my channel, please subscribe and if you would like to become a patron on my Patreon, click on the link below.